What's up, everybody? Welcome to Rear Nigger Radio. I'm one of your hosts, Jake Kilstein. I'm the other host, Drew Weatherhead. How's it going out there in isolation land, everyone? You guys do? <laughs> yeah, that's a great That's a great question. You guys, uh, you guys fucking going crazy? You know what I hear a lot of people are doing right now is getting on Netflix, and uh, they've had to, like, throttle down their internet usage because so many people are using it at the same time. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I heard they're dropping the bandwidth, uh, like, uh, limitations. You know what? I'm going to, if Netflix goes, I'm going to go back on everything we said in the last couple of podcasts. I'm going to open the, <laughs> open the gym up and train y'all. <laughs> you're going to get Corona sometime. You might as well fucking get that shit while you're young. Right. Have you, have you jumped on there recently? There's this show that everybody's watching called Tiger King. No, I do. The, I'm, that that? Douche, I'm that douchebag where whenever I see someone, like whenever I see like a ton of people posting about something. I'll be like, uh, I'm too good for that, man. I don't want to succumb to mainstream pressure. And then like 10 years later, I'm just like, I just found Rick and Morty. It's fucking incredible. It's so good. It's like counter hipster. You're going the wrong direction in time. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Rick and Morty, I was late to the party. But I also feel like I'm even more of a douchebag, though. I'm just going to air out all my pretentious (laughs) vulnerabilities. Uh, More of a douchebag where once I started watching Rick and Morty, because a bunch of douchebags watch rick and morty but then i started watching rick and morty and i just assume i'm like the douchebags don't get it they don't get the (laughs) the layers that i get when i watch rick and morty and i see the sadness in the characters and i they're just laughing at space dicks or whatever the fuck you know i love Uh, space dicks that was the best part space dicks was my favorite uh it was a two-part episode you guys don't (laughs) know uh the ball showed up in part two hi everybody i hope you guys are hanging in there um i I, I'm getting, like, I miss jujitsu a lot, but the emails I'm getting the most from our fans, from our listeners, like, not my podcast people, but, like, ours, mm-hmm. are really, like, a lot of people are really struggling um, strictly or, or primarily because they can't train. Like, it, like okay, so, so if we're, if we're going to compare... Um, emails i get if i get an email from someone who listens to like my solo podcast Mm -hmm. and they're having trouble it'll be like hey i'm feeling really isolated i'm getting anxiety like i'm nervous should i be panicking and then if i get one from like our people it's just like i'm thinking about arm bars a lot i tried to (laughs) i tried to zoom with my class and my connection wasn't working because everyone was watching some dumb tiger show i'm gonna watch in like five years um and it's only jujitsu. Like again, the layers of problems that my regular fans have just out the window. So many. The one specific but infinitely more dramatically phrased problem that our listeners have are like, can't train, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't choked a neck in fucking forever. I know. How you want to hear how how weird and ironic our our uh, group of people became immediately after this isolation is what is the one fucking thing that everybody wants to avoid in class corona oh <laughs> the one fuck that, that just avoids class all <laughs> the two, together the, two the second the second is uh the warm-ups right yeah. everybody hates the fucking warm-ups it's, that's it's all we can do running now. joke now that that's the funniest thing is we're <laughs> literally like trying to stay sane with only doing warm-ups like that was bound like, to fail Every, <laughs> yeah everybody you see and dude i did it too for my gym it's like they threw uh here's what you can do by yourself it's like nobody really wants to do that like this is sort no. of like, like the only giving fun, you the only sort of fun one is the forward roll if you like dive for it and you can't do that without knocking over a bunch of shit in your apartment <laughs> where it's just like, I guess I can just hip heist and like hip escape on my carpet. Like this is, there's no fucking way. I, what are you doing to, are you doing any exercise? I assume to, oh, like, f- chasing your children and eating. Yeah, no, I'm uh, here's the funny thing too, is people were uh, saying, well, if you're not going to be training for this long, everybody's injuries are going to be getting so much better. I can't wait to start feeling better. I haven't felt any better, Jamie. In fact, I'm starting to feel worse. Dude, I don't know how this works, but (laughs) not getting injured as often has made me feel less 
healthy. <laughs> so my theory for you is because your diet is so atrocious. Wonderful. That the fact that you paused and your adrenaline has stopped for like a minute, mm. your body's like, wait the fuck a minute. And it's realizing all the garbage you put into your body and you're going to slowly deplete. Um, I wrote a post. I feel like I, I think I was the first one who made like, or one of the, that made that joke where I was like, our bodies are going to heal. Like I made this mm -hmm. big post about it. And, uh, and then there's this, there's this bit, um, in my workout video, the home workout video where I'm just like eating and I can't do a technical stand up and shit where I go to do a push up and my shoulder hurts so bad still. And I don't know why I don't remember injuring it that I can barely do a push up. And then the next line is me going to my fake person off camera. Like I thought my fucking injuries were supposed to heal. And that was a hundred percent legit. Yeah. Like that was like, I went to do a push up and I was like, Nope. Uh, <laughs> and then I just over dramatized it. I like made myself collapse and I yelled, but uh, yeah, no, I hear you. I mean, there are times when I remember I was in Australia for a minute and my ex and I trained together and uh, we weren't training in Australia and both of us, like she fucked up her knee walking up steps and like, I like whatever people are like jujitsu is dangerous. It's like, no, if your body like atrophies, I feel like very, I feel very fragile. Yeah. That's what I think is going on right now is I feel like um, delicate, like an office person. All I'm doing is sitting in a chair or on a yeah. couch. That's yep. it. Like you're gonna get like tendonitis soon, right? Because like, <laughs> look, look, I'm not what you would consider a fit, healthy person by lifestyle. It's just the martial art that I chose. That the martial I arts love. makes you incredibly fit. I would never, I would never do healthy things if it wasn't this fun. Oh God, I know. Have you guys? tried to like do normal people workouts it's I the just, worst i keep just muttering to myself this is so fucking stupid this is so fucking dumb like i'm doing pull-ups and i'm just like all right i guess i fucking did that <laughs> sure uh i this is so embarrassing to admit but i will i had two days where i just gave up and i was like i'm not gonna do fuck all because mm -hmm. i had like I feel like I found some YouTube video and I was like, all right, I'm going to do this. But my shoulder, it was like a ton of push up stuff. And so I couldn't really do, I can do pull-ups for some reason, but I can't push with my mm -hmm. shoulder. Right? It's like one, it, it's whatever muscle when I go to throw a hook, like even when I'm shadow boxing, I can't throw a hook. That's so the shoulder know. hook muscle. The shoulder hook muscle. Right, right, right. And um, it, it's very specific of the, to uh, Jersey natives <laughs> um, <laughs> due to the toxins in the air. Uh, and I, was so bummed out I couldn't do it. That was like the day I got depressed out of this whole like quarantine. And I just rationalized to myself, you know, when you give yourself a bad life decision, but if you say it in a calm adult voice, you're like, oh, that sounds right. I go, you know what? I'm just gonna like <laughs> eat whatever I want for this quarantine, treat myself and not work out. And then my brain was like, that sounds good. <laughs> and I did it for like two days and I felt, I mean, dude, I ate so much and I'm fucking vegan. So like it, but I, I ate so much and I felt so sick and I got so depressed and I didn't know what I was going to do. And then I go, you know what? I'm just going to take a fucking day off. I'm going to turn the internet off. I'm going to turn my phone off and I'm going to like get a little high and watch nineties martial arts movies. Cause that, <laughs> that was my favorite. And so I go to watch Lionheart <laughs> with Jean-Claude Van Damme. And there's a scene where he puts on a hoodie and goes for a run. And I am so impressionable that within five minutes, I didn't even wait for the movie to end. I pressed pause and I put on a hoodie and I went to run. And suddenly I was like, this is fucking awesome. And I loved it because- The weirdest part was when you started speaking in a French accent too. I started speaking in a French accent. Um, when I get back to jujitsu, I'm only going to be doing spinning wheel kicks <laughs> uh, and splits somehow. Uh, a lot of dancing. And uh, and I have an evil twin that will eventually uh, team up with me, and we fuck a blonde chick. Double impact, really. <laughs> uh, that's all I remember. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Uh, chick gets fucked by one of the Van Dams, maybe both of the Van Dams, which is morally ambiguous. Ambiguous. <laughs> Ambi oh Jesus. Um, so anyway, but as goofy as that sounds. If you can, my advice to people, instead of just doing fucking hip escapes in the kitchen, mm. is for me at least, because I'm 
an impressionable 15 year old boy and want to have sex with blonde girls, I guess. Um, <laughs> if I can uh, associate or correlate the workout I'm doing with fighting, then I'll love it. So what I mean is like, I hate running. Mm -hmm. But if I'm watching like a countdown or something and they show like fucking Khabib and his team and like hoodies and I can associate it with, right, this is what fighters do. And there's that direct correlation with fighting, then I can do it. And I've worked out every day since that dumb fucking Van Damme movie because I just will think about fighting or I'll throw shadow boxing in, in between like rounds of uh, body weight bullshit. But mm. if fighting isn't involved at all, no fucking way. I'm just gonna you know, eat. you know what I think is going to happen here. This is an idea I've been having after watching Tiger King. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is that as far as I know, and I'm pretty well up on the science of virology. You can yeah. trust me when I say that. Um, I'm pretty That's sure that. Correct. Yes. I'm pretty sure that uh, I'm accurate when I say that this coronavirus COVID-19 can't be transmitted um, between people and animals maybe outside of bat I don't know that one's still out out in the park um, sure. but if you were to say fight a horse hmm. or or like a small chimpanzee this might be the way to actually like we might be seeing a transition in martial arts from human versus human to this human real, versus animal yeah this is and, a real bum yeah this is a bummer because I did just order a small chimpanzee on Amazon, but I ordered uh -huh. him for friendship because I'm very lonely. Oh, he'll be a great sparring partner. He'll suck. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I thought we were going to hug. You strangled me. I could try all my new stuff on him. Uh, <laughs> you got to yeah. wait to order that black belt chimp. It's uh, Oh, we should say Robert Drysdale's on the show today, everybody. It's true. It's not just going to be us, sadly. Why, why did the chimpanzee make you think of that? Uh, because I mean, Robert he's pretty Jesus, hairy, but I just... he's a yeah, he's a big hairy <laughs> ape of a man. Um, <laughs> we had a phone call yesterday that I wish I could tell all of you about because it was so personal and inappropriate and great. He's the best, yeah, he's the best. Um, but uh, yeah, so we talked to him about a bit of a controversial topic. Dude, it's like one of the most controversial topics because it's he it's, thinks vaccines cause autism. <laughs> <laughs> For it's proliferate, pro, proliferated by Carlos uh, Machado and Yulio Gracie and, <laughs> yep, yeah. and uh, there's a vast conspiracy and yep. you know, that's uh, not what we're talking about. Yeah, Drysdale uh, was saying some weird shit about 9-11 and Jews. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I mean, to be honest with you, the the it, it, it's uncomfortable. But it's a good interview. I, I really enjoyed this. Look, um, I haven't, we we recorded this already, obviously, but I haven't listened back to see just how far into the weeds me and Rob got before Jamie had to jump in there and drag us back out. Because uh, yeah. <laughs> me, and, me and Robert, obviously Robert, for those who don't know, um, is working on the Close Guard documentary, which is uh, trying to dig up the real life history of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and its early inceptions based off of like old articles and Brazilian newspapers and, and interviews it, with red belts. And it theorizes that um, maybe the uh, mythos that we have all been handed, uh, there's a little more to that. There's a little more to that. hundred percent. And this is what's going to be so exciting. This movie isn't out yet, but I am just foaming at the mouth waiting did you see the trailer? i saw the trailer i'm gonna share the trailer i've actually the got trailer a meaning to is, share it oh no tra uh, share it fucking after we air the interview yeah that's a good From idea business baby it's, Hollywood. it's awesome but look i got a friend um who's deeper into uh, martial arts history than i am and the he, ghost of helio gracie <laughs> dude dude i could talk for hours with this guy and i have and he was like look it shouldn't come to any surprise it shouldn't come as any surprise to anybody that brazilian jiu-jitsu's uh quote-unquote history isn't exactly as accurate as you might think it is because none of them are he started right. listing off all of the uh, myth mythoses of all of these other styles, karate, kung fu, Christianity, uh, taekwondo, Christianity, yeah. <laughs> religion. Like this is what happens. And we actually kind of talked Christianity about Christianity was like the worst martial art because they just let the other person slap their other cheek over and over. It never really worked. I know that happened. And then like the big move, they only got to uh, do once. 
Yeah, yeah, only one of them was allowed to come back from the dead. Uh, I think that was yeah, very, that you know, yeah, we, yeah. You, you, you get me. You got where I got I, was you. Going. I got you. <laughs> um, the I like this interview because yeah, for you like history buffs, Drew and Robert get into the weeds. I'm a big dum dum when it comes to stuff like that. So, but I've been friends with Drysdale for like fucking a decade. So what I tried to do was either play the role of the dum-dum or Drew and Robert's conversation was so fascinating that there could be something kind of broader. Like I sort of hit it from like more of a uh, like philosophical. Um, yeah. Yeah. By the end of it, it got really, really deep philosophically. The I, end of it got really dude, cool. There were some lines in there we're going to have to clip out because uh, like to use by themselves because they're so profound. Yeah. When he talks, when I talk, um, there's a point where I ask him basically who he thinks the goat was in the Gracie family because there's this ongoing feud uh, between uh, people who think it was Hickson, people who think it was Holes. And he had just the perfect answer for it. That all, you guys got to hear it. Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, all of it is, it's a really cool interview and I'm really excited about this. And actually, Robert and I are talking about maybe working on other projects together with Drew and uh, yeah, he's just a good dude. He's so smart. He's such a smart guy. I remember the first time we hung out in Vegas, he just wanted to ask me because I interviewed Noam Chomsky a bunch and he just wanted to talk about Chomsky and I just wanted to ask him about like, fucking dumbass jujitsu questions it was like a blue belt too so they were probably just like abysmal questions oh probably yeah oh boy all right should so we get to the interview oh before we get there let's let's talk about this thing that happened the other day um so i was washing my geese okay because uh, you know i've got a lot of geese and it comes yeah. down to the point where I haven't been training so much recently that they're all clean, which is, hasn't happened, I think, in my entire training career. There's always like a cycle going on, right, that you never mm. quite catch up on. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. So I finally caught up on them, and now I'm going to have to part with very, very many of them because I have way more than I thought I did. <laughs> oh, no. So I've started to index them by, um, you know, which ones are rare, which ones are awesome and um there's gonna be a lot of homeless people walking around with shitty geese in your area <laughs> of canada if you donate them yeah specifically my size too yeah, yeah, <laughs> all, these, just, all these a2 homeless they look like kids around. in their fucking parents outfits which just like bad he drew's very tall <laughs> um so what uh, uh which ones uh i mean i'm on the edge of my seat which ones did you <laughs> dude i i gotta be perfectly honest my origins are in a category all their own oh. It, it doesn't even make sense. Even just folding them is a pleasure. They just feel so much nicer. And you I get actually, those good feelings remembering what it was like to strangle blue belts wearing them. I have been rolling around uh, in my origin geese almost, some would say, sexually mm. because I miss jujitsu so much. And I also – I miss – American pride. And when I roll around, you know, because I'm, I'm locked inside, I'm going stir crazy. I sometimes, I'm going to be honest, I forget that I'm an American. I'll try humming the Star Spangled Banner. I'll try screaming something racist out the window. Um, I'll try to order just French fries at McDonald's. They don't deliver just French fries. It's fine. That's a, another issue. Um, but then when I roll around in my origin geek, um, I wouldn't say sexually. That's kind of insulting to origin. Sensually, there's more of like a connection. Sure. There's sure. like a deeper wow. connection. And uh, I it's just, I remember what jujitsu is like. And I remember, I remember the looks that Americans gave each other after September 11th, which is ironically kind of what we're going through right now with Corona, where there's a tragedy and we need to come together as a country. And the way I feel like, sure, I can feel like an American if I say hello to my neighbor like I just texted my my older neighbor and asked her if like there was anything I could do for her blah 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 but when I really feel that American pride is when I'm rolling around in my origin geese on the floor usually just in the tiny tiny shorts um and the reason is because uh their geese are made in America they're the only geese that are made in America that's true if you order another gi online from another gi company, they're probably not made in America, and it possibly could be what brought the coronavirus over. Uh, let me just put it to you this way. If I were <laughs> going to walk out naked uh, of the shower and put mm -hmm. on a house coat, mm -hmm. the house coat would be origin, and yeah. then the towel that I grab to dry my balls yeah. would be Show your own. <laughs> every other gi. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, oh. Uh, and by the way, if you guys are are, are, are kind of uh, hurting right now, you'll get a little discount. 
Um, it is so important right now when it comes to schools, when it comes to jujitsu equipment, that we keep these fucking good places in business and thriving so that they are around when we uh, come back. And so you can Dude. go to or originmain.com, use promo code rear naked, and you'll get a, a nice little discount. And we don't ask for money. We don't have a Patreon. We don't ask you guys for donations, but this is what keeps the show running are both of our sponsors, yeah. super rare and origin. So by supporting them, um, you're really helping out. Uh, our show and you're keeping our show on the air so if you care about our show go get some dope shit at super rare which we'll talk about after the interview origin use our promo code so they know we sent you and also so you get a, a little discount you were gonna say something yeah dude um i've been watching their social media origin that is and they're repurposing some of the things that some of the materials they make in their factory to make masks and like face shields for first responders and that's doctors incredible i mean that's yeah. one of the things we fucked up uh that america yeah. kind of dropped the ball on we yeah but they're sitting on this this factory right now that oh, you know they've got this that's amazing exactly it's, it's the most american thing they could do they really are quality salt of the earth people that are doing all the right things so they're the type of people you want to support uh like robert drysdale as well who we're going to get to Hi, buddy. I haven't seen you in so fucking long. How are you? You're, you suck at replying to text messages, man. Like I wrote you, <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote like five people. Like I wanted their opinions on the special edition gi that I'm making for the film. Uh -huh. mm. And you're one of them. Drysdale, can I ask you a you're question? the only one who doesn't reply. I, I text like UFC champions, motherfucker. Can reply. I ask you but, a question real quick? What time did you send me that text message? What? what? It was at like two in the morning. I got it like five days later, and I was like, "Did Robert Drysdale text me at two in the morning with a picture of a an old timey gi?" I by the time I got it, I like didn't know what was happening. No, man, I, I was just like, because I, here's the thing: I don't know if it's a really corny idea or if it's the greatest idea ever. It's just like one of those things. It's gonna be one or the other. Look, all that matters is I'm cooler and more aloof than UFC champions. That's what I got from that story. <laughs> Yeah, now he's never going to text you back. He's like, he's like super Mr. Important. He don't fucking <laughs> get a text message. No, you know what it is, too? Once it's gone, it's the opposite of important. Once it's gone too long, I get anxiety about being a bad friend. And I'm like, well, I can't respond. Cool gee, like two weeks later. So I'm like, I just have to wait till time passes. Then I'll have my podcast. Certainly he'll forget and he won't open the interview with it. And uh, we'll be good. We'll see it comes up. And now Jamie's 10 levels deep on anxiety. Good. I'm just going to slowly close my laptop. <laughs> well, Dude, I, I miss you. you. But uh, no, I miss you, bro. You got to visit. I was, well, I was going to. Uh, Both you guys, actually. Drew's never Yeah, been man. Here. Rob, I haven't seen you in years. It's, it's good to see you again, buddy. Likewise, bro. Mm -hmm. Well, I will. I've stayed in your home. I made you, uh, we videotaped uh, wrestling moves on your trampoline. It's a good move, by the way. You should use it. <laughs> it's so fun that could have been a very huge series i should have pitched it to mtv so i'm super excited that we got you on the podcast because i'm a bit of a uh, martial arts history nerd uh and i got a friend who's twice as nerdy as me and we're both super psyched about this uh, documentary that you've got working on right now called close guard so uh first of all big props to you for doing it um, I've got I don't know what you're talking about, by the way. He texted me about it uh, several years ago, and I did not respond. <laughs> <laughs> no, no surprise there. Um, it was funny because I was talking to a Purple Belt student of mine about uh, talking to you about this documentary. And he's like, Robert's the perfect person to do it because he's the jujitsu day walker. He's half Brazilian and half American, so he <laughs> kind of runs both lines at the same time. Smart. It's like Barack Obama. <laughs> you so can't lose. President. Yeah. The Obama of jiu-jitsu. Yeah, man, like, um, it was, you know, ironically, I never cared about the history of jiu-jitsu. I mean, as much as everyone else does, kind of, like, somewhat interested. I thought I knew something about it. But I always approached it with, like, a bit of skepticism, I guess, in the sense where, like, some of it sounded a little fishy. And it was just, whenever you hear that story of it's too, it's too Rocky Balboa, it's too Karate Kid. Mm -hmm. it's too good of a story like wait a second here like that's not how people are like you know you end up, <laughs> you end up learning more enough about people in the jiu-jitsu world you know and what's true now is you know people haven't changed right it's probably true then so i approach it with a little bit of skepticism so wait so real quick before you because i want to unpack that a little bit just for people who may not even know what you're talking about already before you dive into what you uncovered and what you looked for what's the part of the story like when you say 
this story's too good to be true. This is a little karate kid. What is that? If you could sum up, what's the elevator pitch of the story you're talking about? That's too good to be true. Um, everything but how jujitsu developed in Brazil, like the whole, you know, might have taken Carlos under his wing, which may or may not have happened, you know. Um, the whole, like, them having created a style that was superior. Um, and, and, you know, and a lot of that is, I think that some of that propaganda was necessary to some extent. I think that, and a lot of historians disagree with me on this one, but this is my take. Because I don't have a dog in this fight, you know. Like, I've been called a Gracie lover and a Gracie hater in the last <laughs> year of my life. And you know, I really don't have a dog in this fight. I'm more concerned with, like, can we tell this story as accurately as possible, which is not easy to do, obviously, so mm -hmm. many interpretations. But when it comes to, um, you know, the development of jiu-jitsu, I feel that if it were not for the Gracie family, we would all be doing judo. I, I feel right. very strongly about that. Like, judo would have overwhelmed. Like, BJ, there would not have been a niche in, you know – for for bjj to exist right so for example you gotta ask yourself the question why not peruvian jiu-jitsu plenty of japanese immigrants in peru why not hawaiian jiu-jitsu plenty of japanese in hawaii why brazil right now there are plenty of japanese in brazil probably the biggest hub for japanese immigrants at the time till this day probably lots of japanese but we don't know this but there are many many japanese in brazil but i think that you know um Kilio and carlos perhaps out of out of financial need, out of vanity, out of, there's a, there's a little bit of that playing a role. They really hustled hard to carve a niche outside of judo. And that allowed time and space for what we call Brazilian jiu-jitsu to exist, right? So we give them a lot of credit for that. But at the same time, on the technical side, there, there were no innovations. Like Japanese were light years ahead of Brazilians. My opinion, up to the 90s, really. Wow. It, we have the inception of IBJJF that Brazil really took the lead in terms of technical developments. Um, the thing is that in Japan, those techniques that were very old, they existed, but they were very, they were limited to Kosen Judo and some mm -hmm. other traditional, more traditional uh, schools in Japan. But, you know, they, you know, the Japanese kind of like forgot about it. And there's an interesting interview we did with Yuki Nakai in Tokyo. Yuki is sort of like the ambassador for BJJ in Japan. I love the, I love the fact that he's the, the, the Japanese president of the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Japanese Federation. <laughs> right. And he goes and says something. When we discovered that there was this, you know, this thing called Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in Japan, the first thing was shock. That was the first feeling was like, what is this? Who are these people? Right? Because they had no idea that all of that was been going on in Brazil for decades. And the second was fear because they realized how good the Brazilians were. And the third element was that they had forsaken or neglected a treasure that they had for a long time, and they just weren't paying attention to it. And those are the three, uh, those are three feelings that he had from the, the explosion of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you know, first in Brazil and then around the world and then later Japan. But I thought it was a very honest, and I think that that's kind of the approach that you would expect from from, you know, people who in a lot of ways neglected the ground fight, largely because of... Kano's feelings towards ground fighting he felt very mm -hmm. much yeah I've um I dropped a meme I, I sent you yesterday that people are getting so wrong in the comment section which is uh pretty I think historically accurate wait but real quick Drew that, mm. I don't believe for one second that people in a comment section on the internet could possibly get anything wrong well let me be tell acting you. with any kind of uh, uh <laughs> disingenuous motives this are you talking right. about the same internet that I'm on right now that I'm along the hunting? They're fully informed, right? They're fully knowledgeable people. They're very happy in with themselves and their life. Very this unbiased <laughs> opinions. <laughs> this, this is part of why I'm so excited to get this conversation done today, particularly mostly as like a fuck you to them. But um, are you going to write them? Hey, the, just wait in two weeks when we. Yeah, interview. that's right. That's right. You just hold on. It's coming. Um, the the meme was basically saying uh the gracie's inventing brazilian jiu-jitsu was uh you know this one guy and then this larger guy behind him was saying uh the 90 percent of it that was judo um i think 90 is being gracious it was probably a little more um but uh oh. go ahead yeah so, yeah so i was gonna jump in well like it, it's all judo like as george Medi is like a very important character in this whole story no one's ever heard of him but he's a very important character and we're trying to figure out ways of mentioning him in the film. It's, he's a very difficult character to fit in the story, right? But anyone who's from that generation in Brazil knows George McGee and speaks very highly of him. 
Okay, well, um, let's let, let's uh, get to something that people. I, I'm sure that nobody knows who that is, who's like a, a casual jujitsu well, person. Yeah. So, so what you see in almost every jujitsu gym is a lineage that starts with either Kano or Maeda. So, what about that is not right? Okay, so let's go. Uh, let's 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 for, let's define what a lineage. What is lineage? I'll just, I'll start with myself. I had an instructor in Las Vegas who was called Steve Da Silva. Uh, I also trained a little bit under John Lewis and Gustavo Dantas. And then I moved to Brazil and I trained under Paulo Strecker. And then after that, I trained under Terere and uh, Tellys and those guys. And after that, I trained under Leo Vieira, who gave me my black belt. What's my lineage? Yeah, that's confusing, right? Right. It's, so there, it's, it's a, not only throughout that whole process, I've had other instructors. Those are just the main ones, right? Even my training partners to some extent. Like Damien was never my coach, but he taught me a lot because we went to war so many times. So in right. a way, he taught me more than Tidida did, if that makes any sense. Yeah, right? the totally. No, I mean, even when I was at Marcelo's, I remember some of his black belts who at the time were like purple belts and brown belts. I probably got more from them during certain phases of my jiu-jitsu training than, you know, Marcelo himself or whatever. So, so the term lineage is very arbitrary, right? I think to, we're obsessed with the lineage because, like, we have this view of martial arts that goes, the grandmaster pours all this information to a vessel that is a student, right? And he carries that same information and pours it into the next vessel, which is the next generation. And we all know that learning is not like that, right? Mm -hmm. Learning is far more complex. You're learning from everyone. And, you know, I'm learning from my blue belts. Right. You know, and that's everyone you exchange information with, everyone you, you, it, what brother calls a physical argument, you know, and that's what it is. It's a physical oh, I love that. argument. And everyone you argue with, you learn something new, right? Right. So this uh, is uh, something with Maeda that is, uh, I think you're bringing up in your documentary, but other people have touched on as well, is how much did he actually impart to the Brothers Gracie? So, um, you know, so this is, uh, there's no evidence Carlos ever met Maeda. There is no physical evidence. It's Carlos's testimony, right? That's Carlos said so. And it is, I, 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 I see some, you know, some circumstantial evidence point in that direction. For example, Carlos's father, Gaston Sr., he was an owner of a circus and a fight manager. Maeda was very much part of that scene at the time, mm -hmm. right? Likely that they met, right? Uh, Carlos, when he gets to Sao Paulo, he knows the names of all the instructors in Maeda's school. So he was at least familiar with the gym, right? Given these things, it is very, very likely that Carlos trained. I actually, there is an article that we found on the, the Brazilian National Library that talks about a match in 1921, I believe, from memory, I can't remember the date correctly, um, where a man called Oscar Gracie is fighting a man called Donato Pires dos Reis, right? Which is another important character. We can talk about him later. But this, in this article, basically, is that a man called Oscar Gracie is fighting him in a, in a, in a uh, you know, like a super, super fight kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no Oscar Gracie in the family. It's probably a typo, right? Carlos mm -hmm. or maybe Osvaldo, most likely Carlos. So that's the first time a name Gracie is mentioned in association with the term jujitsu. That has never happened before. It's the, only, it's the very first time that happens. I love the idea of there being a Oscar Gracie who's just like some con man who's like uh, has like some weird like disgraceful uh, backstory. I'm so sorry. Yeah, no, you're good. And <laughs> like a fake mustache. <laughs> so that's the story, right? So Oscar Gracie is most likely car. So we know that there was a Gracie training at the time. The problem is this article mentions, uh, mentions Oscar Gracie as a student of Jacinto Ferro, not of Maeda. Maeda is the referee of the event, but he is not mentioned as the instructor of Oscar Gracie is mentioned as the referee of the event, Jacinto Ferro, who is the coach of Oscar Gracie, right? What that suggests is that Carlos may have done some training with Maeda, but that his teacher was Jacinto Ferro, who was Maeda's right-hand guy. So long story short, the lineage, if you really, you know, like you're going to stick to lineages, which, like I said, are very arbitrary, but they would go Jigoro Kondo, who's the father of martial arts as a whole, not just judo and Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He's the godfather of martial arts as we know it, as we understand it today. And then there would go other instructors in the, in the Kodokan, Tomita, one of them, but they might have very likely had other instructors, including catch wrestlers. That's another aspect of the story is the impact of Western wrestling and catch wrestling in both judo and Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know that, but catch wrestling influenced Brazilian jiu-jitsu a lot. Right. 
We that. got some, we got some notifications coming in on your side. I think, uh, Go Rob, do you got something that you can turn off on your on your laptop? I just want to do that, man. I'm like yeah. technology impaired. <laughs> okay, I'm I was gonna a lot make of dings a, on my end. I was gonna make a hilarious joke saying that means your time is up, and then I was gonna go to my <laughs> I was gonna go to my next question. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, if I don't know, I really don't know how to do this. I'll I can't mute it because if I mute it, you guys are listening. Like, I can't. That's yeah, right. Okay. I'll, I'll well, make a I'll make a hilarious joke every time. Just sure. real quick, but before we get back into. Uh, the film and what you found, I kind of want to ask you a more philosophical question because you, you've mentioned lineage a couple of times and I'm actually curious about your thoughts. One, do you think when you said that people kind of have this need for lineage, do you think that comes from sort of, I mean, same with like our need for like religion and a leader and someone just to, this is the person I go to and this person gives me answers. And it kind of almost dumbs down us thinking for ourselves, which ties in the second part of the question, which is, do you think that our obsession with lineage causes some problems, whether it's someone doesn't want to leave their shitty school because they want to get their black belt from this lineage, or someone can't cross train here because that lineage is upset with this. Um, or do you think that it is, you know, fine and just kind of, a, can it be done in a normal traditional way without causing problems? I think that this past tends to be sacred, right? The older it is, the more sacred it becomes, right? So when you create, um, you know, we, we Tufi calls one of our inter, the historians we interviewed, he calls the invention of the past, right? Like once you attach mm. a, a, a thread between the present and the past, that grants you a lot of legitimacy. And that's, that in itself is not wrong, in my opinion. I don't think that in itself is a problem. The problem is when you're distorting facts and you're taking credit away from people who deserve it in order to construe a narrative that suits you in the present. It's the rewriting of history, right? You know, so that's, that's the only issue I have with it. So, um, you know, to answer your question, no, I, I think an attachment to the past in itself is not wrong as long as it's accurate. So one thing we want to do with this film is take people off pedestals and, you know, just, you know, put things in perspective in the sense where jujitsu was not, Brazilian jiu-jitsu was not a development of Carlos and Kido by themselves. Mm. It was a, 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 a you know, a cooperation of a number of different people, including Japanese, including other Brazilians, even Which though- fucking Kuto cool, by the way. And, and, and Carlos clearly play a central role in all of this. But to say that they invented something or that they did something yeah. that Japanese, it's just, that's when like, okay, now you're trying to, you know, create like, it's the, it's the, the, the putting on pedestals of people that I don't like, mm. especially when it's in detriment of other people who deserve to be remembered. Yeah, this is the confusing part, I think, for a lot of people who are trying to look at it from a modern view, because most people who are in these comment sections or even just uh, people training in general today, they're looking at from like the 2000s forward, this is what Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is. So they sort of transpose that back to the 1920s or the 1950s, and it doesn't apply anymore. So you get... Um, terms like Japanese jiu-jitsu have a bad name nowadays, but back in the day, that was the, the predecessor to judo. Um, and judo nowadays has a certain uh, uh, feel to it because of Olympic judo, which has very little to do with the judo of the 1920s. Yeah. Yeah. And martial arts evolve and that's sort of, you know, natural progression of anything you get. You're going to, you're going to turn it into a competition. It's going to evolve and, you know, people are going to have different you know, um, ways of looking at the art. Like judo itself is the, the split between judo and Brazilian jiu jitsu. So we spent some time talking about that because that's a bit. Oh, good. Uh, but the split takes place because at some point Brazilians and Japanese no longer agreed on the rules. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when Helio fought Ono, he got taken down 32 times, and, but that was no point system. The second time he got, they fought, I think it was 26 or 27 times. Same thing, no points in place. So Ono the third time goes like, I want points in place. These are the internationally accepted judo rules, right? Like, oh, we're not doing judo, we're doing jiu-jitsu. It's different, right? So Brazilians, like, they carve out this, this, this niche inside of Olympic judo, and they no longer could communicate because they had become so highly specialized, specialized in, in, in their own realms. And as a result, like, the judokas no longer cared about what was going on in Brazil, like, because judo was so big at the time. And the Gracie family, they, they, they stuck to their way of doing things, right? And, and it was largely a strategy because they really couldn't hang with the Japanese. If you're sure. in, like if technically the Japanese were superior at the time. Um, but it did allow time for a different aspect of judo, Olympic judo that had died to develop. 
right? So, so, so yeah, when you say, so for people who don't know a lot about the history listening, um, when you said earlier that a, 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 a ton of jujitsu, uh, you know, was Japanese or, or, or based in judo, um, I think when people nowadays, I mean, myself included, really, when I think of judo, I think of, you know, big heavy throws, using grips, and that I suck at it. Um, I think of it primarily at sta- as stand-up. Uh, I'm, I'm convinced it doesn't work on me. <laughs> I just, I hate, I, I'm not good at it. Um, and people think, oh, you either have a judo base or, or a wrestling base. But for people who don't know any of these fucking names besides Gracie, uh, when it comes to the, the strict physicality of it, when you said so much of jiu-jitsu is judo, um, can you go into that a little bit? Well, it's all judo. So, like, just like George McGee, who was, like, one of the, the brains behind the development of BJJ, he referred to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as bad judo. That's what he <laughs> I love that. And, and he's right in a lot of ways. He's not completely incorrect. It's just that the perception, the modern perception of judo is, like, what you mentioned, standing in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is ground. When in reality, they're the same thing. The rules are different. If you pay mm-hmm. attention, it's, they're the same art. The rules differ, right? BJJ allows for guard pulling, whereas judo doesn't. That's pretty much, and then judo has like you can't do this, you can't do that. Oh, I guess I'm a fucking judo guy now. I'm yeah, like, I don't, I don't like guard pulling. Judo, and it's just that you're not good standing; you prefer the ground, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, it works. So, um, and I think that's where some of the confusion comes from: is that people think that they're completely separate arts, and they they have a same matrix. Is that the rules push them in different directions to the point where they're not recognizable anymore because of the rules? Yeah, I, I like to tell people who think that uh, grounds like Nawaza or or the ground style that we prefer Brazilian Jiu Jitsu has nothing to do with Judo. I, I tell them to look up Kosen Judo. The first yeah. pictures that come up are black and white pictures of Della Hiva guard. If there's a Bering Bolo video, if you put Judo Bering Bolo on YouTube, you'll be able to find it. There's a Bering Bolo, I suspect, from the 1940s, 50s. Yeah, they used to call it a helicopter suite. Highly, highly uh, advanced technically. And but here's the thing, the interesting like that, there's no link between Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Kosen. They, mm-hmm. the, the link is Judo, Olympic Judo. It's just that there were Japanese that felt the same way the Gracie family and other Brazilians felt, where it's like, oh, this ground stuff is important. Let's do a little bit more of this. And the Japanese side of that tree is called Kosen Judo, but there's never been an interchange between Kosen Judo. There's no influence between. Isn't that interesting that they kind of came to the same conclusion then? Well, human anatomy is the same. Exactly. Yeah. You spend enough time on the ground trying to submit each other, you're going to reach the exact same conclusions. Now, the rules of Kosen Judo are a little bit different, but their ground game is very. I mean, they play spider guard, right? So, ironically, when we interviewed some Kosen Judo, uh, we went to two universities in Japan, Tokyo and Kyoto to speak to their instructors. And, you know, when you speak to the kids there, the, the kids who are practicing Kosen Judo, their heroes are Leandro Lowe and Rafael Mendy. It's really interesting, but they use Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as a reference for them. Like that's- I'm so really excited cool. for this documentary. It's, uh, it's, it's what, one difficult thing about it, and this one thing that might, it's gonna be difficult to please everyone, right? Mm-hmm. Because there's so much information. Like, first off, we gotta tell 100 years of history in a 90 minute. <laughs> Right. You have to introduce new characters that no one's ever heard of, right? Mm. From background, you can't do that in you know twenty seconds. And you have to correct history. Before you correct history, you have to tell what's incorrect about it. Mm. So you got to tell the incorrect version and then correct it. So to squeeze all of that in ninety minutes is is a very and that's where we got stuck. Is you're like the Howard Zinn. This is like the people's history of the United States. It's like the Howard's Inn of, uh, uh, like Howard's, How, Howard's, people's history of the United States, uh, I'm sure Drysdale knows, one of the most important historical books ever. It's like very long. And I remember, uh, you know, it was the first one that was like, hey, Christopher Columbus was a fucking monster. And I remember when I first read it, I was like, they were like, well, this is what you learned in history, but this is a history class, but this is the truth. And I was like, jokes on you. I didn't learn anything in history class because <laughs> I was stoned and I dropped out of high school. And so it was very confusing to me. So I, I, I definitely, I empathize with everything you have to do. And I just want to say on a personal note, I was, I remember being in your kitchen, uh, making your kids eggs. So who's a bad friend now? And you were telling me about this and you were almost hesitant. And I just want to go on record saying this, unless you want me to delete it. You were almost hesitant about this because you were like, I don't want, 
I don't want it to, I'm paraphrasing, but I don't want it to seem like I'm starting shit just to do it. You just legitimately yeah. cared. And I've always known you as a really academic guy. Um, and you were like, I just want to tell the history. You know, it wasn't like some clickbait bullshit where you were going to make a DVD called like Anti Gracie by Robert Drysdale yeah, or some uh, well, shit. It's, 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 I, I mean, it's, it's easy to blame me because, oh, Robert got smashed by Roger. So clearly this is a vendetta. It's like, first off, everyone that. got smashed by Roger. It wasn't just me. <laughs> so let's get that one out of the way. Wait for <laughs> Buchecha's documentary to come out. <laughs> yeah. Literally thinking that there's some, you know, like, it's hate or it's an attack on the grace. I actually got, it's funny because, like, at first, the Fada camp was very excited about this. Mm, I bet. And, and they were very, like, oh, this is our story going to be told. And, like, there's, they're, they're part of our story as well. We are going to mention them, of course. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's things that are inaccurate about their story. There's no evidence Luis Franz ever trained with Maeda either. And that's their whole claim to fame is that they trace the lineage back to Maeda. Well, oh, no, that's interesting. The evidence we have actually suggests the Gracie Academy, that, that Luis Fronsta was, in fact, a student of the Gracie Academy, of Helio Gracie specifically. So, and we have evidence for that. And we wrote, I wrote an article on it. And, you oh, know, no. <laughs> so, the father went from being my, like, loving me to all of a sudden, like, they now they don't like me. So, you know, and I think that there's no way you can make everyone happy. But, but that's, that's important. I just want to cut you off to compliment you. Like, that is important. It's, if you were making a documentary that one side was like fawning over, now it's kind of suspect, right? Whereas when you are dealing in facts, facts are usually not as sexy as people would like them. And there's a lot of fucking gray area with politics, with religion, with jujitsu, um, that I think that that kind of is an argument for why this is important as well. You know what I mean? That it does kind of piss everybody off, but that probably means there's some fucking truth to it. Well, facts can be biased, right? Mm. The truth can be biased. You can't get angry at fact if it's a fact. Now, what you could say is, oh, Robert is, you know, this is how you can lie. You can lie by omission, right? You can um, select the facts that are convenient to a certain thesis and ignore yeah. other facts that you don't like, for example. And as executive producer, producer, I'm also in, like directly involved in, in, in writing this documentary. Like, I, yes, you have the power to do that. You realize that I can neglect this if I wanted to. But that's not the case. Like everything that comes about that we feel is relevant, you know, I would love for someone to show me a piece of evidence that Luis Franza trained with Maeda. We would 100% include that. Or Carlos Gracie for that matter. If anyone can provide evidence that Carlos Gracie met Maeda, we would put that in the documentary. But then you get people get angry and they say, yes, yes, he has. Like, well, show me the evidence and they don't have anything, right? So then you shoot in the messenger. And this, this is why there's a part of me, considering the amount of work that I've put into this already and how much, how stressful this has been over the months, there's a part of me that almost like regrets it because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not, I mean, I'm not really making anything from this. It was more of a passion project and, you know, but, um, you know, I wanted to give something back to Jitsu and I like history and I wanted to, I wanted to tell the story of George Gracie, man. No one's ever heard of the man. Like, yeah. that's the other thing. Oh, it's a Gracie hating documentary. Like, George Gracie is one of the heroes of the documentary. How can it be an anti-Gracie documentary? Did you reach out to any of the, the current Gracies uh, oh, about we this? Or? We interviewed Hobson, Carl, Carlos Gracie Jr. We interviewed Kira Gracie. Uh, we tried interviewing, there were a couple other Gracies we tried to interview. Carlay, we tried to interview um, a Hori, and Horian asked for $30,000 to be interviewed. That's it? That's not that's not a front you. That's not a thing that happens. People yeah. don't thirty oh it gets better. So he asked for actually he asked for twenty thousand dollars for the interview. He asked for ten thousand dollars for pictures of Helio Gracie. I almost told him I got more pictures of your dad than you do. Um and then Hala Gracie Was he like that burn is gonna cost you five thousand dollars? No, I, I did. I should have said stuff. I got more pictures <laughs> of Helio than you do. But um he uh and then we i spoke to hala gracie because we want to interview her that's she wrote the the biography of carlos gracie that's roger gracie's mom okay and, and she was yeah, i think a little suspicious at first over the phone call you know like what is robert doing and like after an hour of like listen i'm not trying to attack anyone i'm just trying to get the, the record straight you know and you know and her book is very inaccurate like and this is not an attack on her this is a, a historical analysis of her book it is very inaccurate it's all oral tradition of members of the Gracie family and fa uh, uh, friends of the family, right? So it's a very biased account. Uh, it's not an accurate account. I didn't say that to her, but, you know, it, it, she, she wasn't too friendly, to be frank. And then she asked for a quarter million dollars to 
<laughs> to be interviewed because she felt that we were doing the story of her book and film and like that's not what we're doing i like, feel like i got it i got a great deal just paying you 10k for this interview yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. we got we got up lucky <laughs> yeah i thought it was place anyway like so one of them asked for a quarter million dollars the other one the other one wanted thirty thousand dollars and the other three four actually we interviewed hoist gracie as well so we got hoist kira okay. hobson and carlos gracie jr um what we really want hobson was gold man hobson and carlos gracie jr were gold like they mm. were hobson 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 uh, Hensel's dad hands down the most charismatic person i've ever met he is a lunatic he like man is out of his mind but hilarious well that's where henzo gets it from i guess <laughs> like it was so much fun hanging out with him that day um yeah man we got some 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 gems from from hops and Grace. and man's a true poet like really really fun hanging out with him. i can't wait to see that well and 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 you know this goes back to what you said in the beginning and i would like to highlight it uh as we come to the end because it's really important where you were like, we would not be where we are without the Gracies, right? Like I've had nothing but lovely encounters with uh, Huron and, and Henner and uh, uh, Henzo and, um, and Hodger. I mean, I've trained with Hodger and, and everyone was, was lovely uh, to me. And I, I, I don't think you can, it's incredibly important what they did. It's incredibly important, uh, UFC one and Hoist. Um, but I think again, what you're trying to do is it's also important to uh, hear all sides and to get the facts straight because not even because you just want to discredit potential charlatans, but you want people who bled and sweat for the sport we care about so much to get credit. And that was part of the reason why you um, know exactly was to give credit to the people who were largely forgotten. And I just want to give credit to the book that inspired the, the. Oh yeah, I had that one uh, suggested to me recently okay, by Roberto Pedrera. He this is this is the dean of jiu-jitsu history right here. Um, oh, anyone who wants to learn jiu-jitsu history must refer to these books. They're on Amazon. This is one volume one of three. Okay, For people just listening, it's the book is Choke with a Q U E at the end. C H O Q U E. So spelled incorrectly. That's weird that I got by the editors. Shock means shock. Oh, means shock. shock. Okay. Doesn't mean choke. Yeah, but like it reads like choke. Yeah. Uh, and this is uh, where that would inspire the documentary. And there's this one right here. This one is two volumes. Volume three is coming out. And this is the history of Jiu Jitsu prior to Koro Khan. Or Jigoro Kano. What we're seeing now in jiu-jitsu, there's nothing new about it. Jiu-jitsu has been a professional sport way before judo even existed. So mm. there's, a, there's a worldwide movement of jiu-jitsu that was going on in the 1800s that no one's ever heard of. It's really cool read. If you like history, if you're a history nerd, like this is really cool. Yeah, stuff. I'm going to get both those books for sure. Yeah. Um, so before we let you go, because first of all, again, thank you so much for making this documentary. I'm super excited about it. Um, I know I don't know exactly what all the topics you hit in here, so uh, forgive me if this isn't one of them. But even if it's not in your documentary, I'm curious on your input on one of the other uh, kind of um, debates, I guess, that only history can tell. And we kind of I feel like we get an inner, inaccurate look at it these days. Is uh, kind of the the Any level spoiler? No, <laughs> kind of the um, the who was the greatest Gracie? And nowadays everyone says Hickson, but back in the day they used to say Holes. So do you know anything about that story and how that broke down? Well, it, I mean, we actually, I, I asked Hobson and uh, uh, we actually have it on camera talking about this. And I, I can't remember details of, of the, the conversation, but, you know, apparently Holes used to school Hickson when he was younger. And, you know, and that's not unusual, though. Like, people, once again, like, we tend to look at these historical figures, like, like we have to see the human mind works in a hierarchy, right? That's how the human mind works. They cannot conceive of something that's constantly changing. So the Robert Drysdale that, you know, 180C 12 years ago or 13 years ago is the same guy. Like, no, he's not the same guy. Shit's changing all the time, man. You know, the Jamie Kelsey who started training jiu-jitsu five years ago is not the same guy that's training. It's, it's a completely different person. Man. Thank God. Constantly changing, right? And that's what people have a hard time wrapping their heads around. Like, I'll, I'll give an example. Like, I've been in jiu-jitsu long enough to see there's a moment in every Black Oaks career, everyone who takes this professionally and seriously and trains consistently, where they're untouchable. 
I have seen people live that moment. I have lived that moment where people couldn't score a point on me in practice, right? Here's the thing though. When that moment, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a second. You're there for a moment. You're in your very prime and you feel invincible. And, and then you're doing this right here, right? Next thing, you, and there's no way out of it, right? What Hickson did is was he crystallized the moment where he peaked and he was the guy who was making everyone tap in the gym. And then he disappeared. He stopped training with people publicly. He stopped fighting guys that could potentially beat him. And he crystallized that moment and he turned that moment into the whole story. Mm. But Hickson is not unusual in the sense where he's a good grappler in the history of jiu-jitsu, but there are many good grapplers in the history of jiu-jitsu. The difference is guys like, like Braulio keep fighting, guys like Marcelo keep fighting, guys like Rafael Mendes, a lot of these guys, they keep fighting. The more you fight, the more likely you are. Like Anderson Silva still fighting. Imagine have Anderson retired in his prime. People would remember him as the greatest MMA fighter of all, all time. time. And the crowd yeah. is very unfair and unrealistic about these things and because they don't understand fighting outside of the hierarchy that they set things. A has to be better than B and B has to be better than C. And fighting is not like that. So on paper, Roger's by far the best Gracie of all time, right? And he's followed by Hoyler and Kira Gracie. You know, and they, on, on based off of accomplishments, mm -hmm. right? I'm very skeptic of, you know, things that happen in training because to me that's less important because yes. training is training. No one's, it's not when you have your gay game on. You could be tired, you could be injured, you could be goofing around. I don't take stories that seriously because people do exaggerate a lot for political reasons. Can you give, uh, and this is the last question, can you give your final thoughts on hero worship and how we should intellectually be approaching growth in our jujitsu game? I think the heroes work for a reference. I think that when I was a kid, I had my own, you know, superheroes and whatever. But at some point in life, you, you start realizing that these people aren't – I think the first frustration we have in this sense is that we realize our parents aren't superheroes. At some time when you're 16, 17 years old, you realize your dad is human. You're like, are you guys idiots? Yeah. yeah. And then you realize he's just slightly more mature than you and then you're <laughs> slightly more knowledgeable, right? But they're basically learning as well. And at that point, people lose reference. Like, boy, they need something to look up to. Like, maybe I'm flawed. Maybe dad's flawed. But maybe Hickson is perfect. Right. So this constant search for someone to look up to, to give us a reference point. And I think that maybe, I don't know, I go back and forth on that because it is, a, it, it touches on religion too, because people need a reference, something that guides them to feel like I have to I have to look up to someone for me to feel like I'm going in the right direction. Right. And some people think it's Tony Robbins is their reference. They think yeah. Tony Robbins has something to teach them. Maybe they do. I don't know. I, Personally, I, I don't like hero worship because I think it is detrimental to the individual. The second, like you should be your own hero. Like yeah. who, you know, you, you create the hero you want to be. And that doesn't mean you're not flawed. It doesn't mean you're not going to fuck up a ton. But like you should be your own reference. Your measuring mark is your own potential. And you have to have belief in, in, in your potential. And that's where the bar is, right? Where Who can I be and who do I want to be? And those should be the references, you know, and that's how kind of how I see the world, but everyone's different. I don't judge. I don't think there's better or worse. Uh, I do have people I look up to, you know, sure. and fighting. I've lost all my heroes. Like I've, you know, I, with the, it's, it's interesting, but the closer you see these guys, like the less heroic they, they seem like once you meet them in person. And mm -hmm. I've met a lot of my heroes and they, they were just normal people. Right. Yeah. They were just regular people. And I think that's what fans got to realize that these guys aren't perfect. They just happen to be really good at jujitsu or MMA or whatever. But for personal growth, to answer your question, I think you got to look, you got people got to stop looking outside and look inside. You know, I think that there's a super Jamie and a super Drew in there somewhere. You just got to, I mean, there's a super Robert in there somewhere. And I, I want to find that guy and I want to make that best, that guy the best he can be. And you know, I don't, I don't need to look up to, to anyone for that, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, that was a perfect answer. That was beautiful. And also why I can never meet Jean-Claude Van Damme. Um, Drysdale, I love you so much, man. This was, uh, this was fucking, that last answer was so, so good. Um, yeah, thank you again for doing this. Uh, so what's the best way people can keep up to date on the progress of all of this? And uh, I, am, I am due many updates. What I'm doing now is I'm setting the plan because I plan on having like a release, um, like a schedule thing to start hyping it up a little bit. 
Uh, we plan on doing this organically a lot based off of like fans, like people like yourself, people that are excited about the film and asking for help because this is not something that's financially motivated. It was, it was for jujitsu, right? And so we're going to ask the jujitsu community to help, you know, spread the word as much as possible. There, we do have a Facebook and an Instagram page, uh, close guard, at Close Guard the Movie. So you can follow us and there's some updates on there. I am due many, many updates. We do have a teaser, but I'm not releasing it yet. We have a rough cut of the film. We're missing music and animation. The film is practically ready. We're just finishing the the intro and the outro and adding music. And we're picking a release date. Um, The plan was to finish it in April, which we may or may not finish it in April. But I'm not going to release it until the Master Worlds here in Vegas. That's my plan is to have a movie premiere here in Vegas Saturday night after the event. I will a thousand percent come to that. By the way, you can send me anything about the film and writing I know about. Geese, I literally wear what I'm sent for free. You know what? Like, I just gotta get some background of that story. Like I wanted to do like a collectible item gi, yeah. where maybe it'll make a hundred for the fans of the film, and it's gonna be based off of Jigoro Kano's uniform. Like mm-hmm. the old the YouTube old dogey, yeah. So See, it's, gonna, um, yeah. it's a collectible. It's kinda like buying those Air Jordans that there's only like five of them made and you don't even wear them because they're so special. Mm. That's what I mean. like, I'm going to make a collectible item D for people to hang on the wall and never touch. Right? I mean, that sounds so dope, but Drew's your guy for that. I'm a hundred percent down. I'm so dumb when it comes to history and when it, literally the only names I knew were the ones you dispelled the legend of and today. <laughs> and that was so ruined is, for you. <laughs> it's been a real heartbreaking, uh, heartbreaker of an interview. Tries to tell. Uh, awesome dude. Well, thank you so so much and, and congratulations i will 100 percent drive to vegas uh for the premiere of that uh well, thank you guys for the opportunity mm-hmm. thanks for supporting the film and uh yeah i'll hit you guys up when we're close to release and i'll get you guys tickets to the premiere Yay. awesome yeah i'll 100 percent push that on because jitsu all right brother well we'll see you soon awesome thank you guys all right, bye bye take care guys robert giants now so excited check out drew's instagram uh i mean probably both of ours will have it in the story Mm -hmm. um and yeah go follow drysdale all that stuff yeah just follow close guard the movie i believe is what it's called on instagram just Mm -hmm. just look for close guard it's got all their shit on there and it is it's gonna get you so excited i didn't watch the trailer before Mm -hmm. i think he might have actually released it after our interview after the interview it did yeah but uh I wouldn't have watched it before because I always get like there's this really sweet kid I met. Uh, I guess I'm gonna out him now. Uh, I met in New Mexico and he was like, uh, "Hey, I'm gonna send you my stand-up set." And I was like, mm-hmm. uh, "And I'm not gonna watch it." <laughs> and then our friend Nate, Nate Harris, very good friend, one of my best friends, mm. uh, did stand-up for the first time. He's a very funny guy. Uh, he sent me a stand-up set, and I had to tell him uh, I can't watch it if you value our friendship because if i see everybody's bad it doesn't matter how funny you are how intelligent you are everybody for the first eight years Mm -hmm. eight eight is like the number that most professional comedians give for you to get decent not even to become amazing you know what i mean and so everyone's first set you think if you don't get booed off stage you think it went well (laughs) <laughs> and then like one month afterwards if you look back on it you're gonna be like i'm gonna fucking kill myself i'm gonna give yeah, myself corona dude, and throw I have, myself off the balcony i have three sets of mine that are fully recorded that i you will, will never you will see never that. see no, i'm never going not. to show you <laughs> good see you did the right thing nate just fucking sent it to me with the i mean but he like whatever he has abs he can do whatever he wants True. um and i was just like uh absolutely not and so he goes so let me get this straight you're not gonna watch it because you're afraid it would ruin our friendship and i had to be like correct <laughs> like yes that's exactly what's happening he was like all right man respect um why did i bring that up what what the fuck were you talking about <laughs> we were talking oh, about Drysdale. Drysdale. the movie yeah. so i didn't watch the trailer mm-hmm. because i'm like robert drysdale is very when i see someone good at jujitsu like i didn't watch Robert Drysdale beat Marcelo Garcia and be like, that guy's probably got an eye for cinema. Mm-hmm. Like, I was just like, look at that big dumb ogre choking out my coach. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and then uh, I saw the trailer for this movie and I was like, oh, fuck. This looks like a real fucking movie. Oh, like, yeah. Like, this is no joke. He's traveling around the world. Like, it's Yeah, he spent over incredibly. a year on this thing. 
<sighs> and, and by the way, like I wasn't kidding. I was in his kitchen when he was like, "Do I do this?" Oh, really? Um, yeah. And I was like, I don't know, man. <laughs> he, he, he really like, he's like, I'm not trying to be like, I'm not trying to do like it for like clickbait. He's like, I just really care. Like everything really he said was a chance to take all the credit for it right there. I know. You could have been like, you know what? Everybody else is going to say whatever, man. But I'm going to be the one to step out here and say, you know what, Rob? That's the move. Well, because once again, I didn't know he was going to be a fucking <laughs> fantastic filmmaker. And I didn't yeah. want the movie to be like him on his phone, <laughs> sitting on like a swing outside by his tree and be like, the Gracies are stupid. <laughs> I'm like, what's the matter with Drysdale? Um, I got to bring something up before we go. Mm-hmm. Um, I got really nervous when Corona hit because uh, the economy, lots of our, actually, uh, yeah, I'll do that after. Um, lots of our friends are struggling. Uh, businesses are struggling all over. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to be honest. I fucking r- ran out of money. I was like, credit card went like completely uh, maxed out. Well, isn't and- Trump sending everybody money now? Isn't that how it works? He's like, I'm so rich. Everybody can be rich. Here, have some money. <laughs> I think that's, yeah, yeah, that's... Uh, it was something like that. I remember a press conference. It was, that's it was a lot word, like that. word on the street <laughs> is that's going to happen. And um, and so, but I got fucking nervous. And, you know, I mean, our, our sponsors are keeping us alive. Thank God. But I, mm-hmm. what I didn't understand is ever since my breakup, I'm like, I don't have car payments. I moved out of Los Angeles. Like I've, I've technically, I shouldn't be broke. Um, and uh, the, I was like going through my bills and uh, sure enough, I found the culprit. I canceled my subscription to Flow Grappling <laughs> and thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars came just fucking pouring in you know how many events i've watched on flow grappling tell me how many events what like one and one and a half this is usually all my friends who have it say the exact same fucking thing it's usually some big event it's worlds or adccs you're like i just i just wanted to watch that thing and now my credit card gets charged every month for the next year because i want to watch adcc thousands of dollars and by the way by the way, uh, you know what I really love when I'm like watching an event? I love frantically going from Matt <laughs> to Matt to find which one of my friends is on like some obscure corner mat that doesn't have commentary. And Dude. like, I really love when like all of my fighters or my favorite fighters are fighting at the exact same time. You That's know, really fun. You know what's what's bad is I um was watching this last ADCC um, like after the fact. So I would go the, the evening of and rewatch during the day. And I'd try mm-hmm. to do it in an order that I wanted to watch them. And the problem is there was three mats. Mm-hmm. And whenever somebody won on a mat, yeah. over a giant intercom would be like, Cyborg Abreu loses to... I'm like, no, that's coming up. I haven't... Son of a bitch. It would be like if, uh, if if you went to see like a movie the same weekend Avengers came out and you were like, you were like, you know what? I'm going to wait and see Avengers next week. Yeah. And, and in the like, trailers at the back. beginning is like, Tony Stark dies and our <laughs> movie. <laughs> Like what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. I just yeah. I just wanted to see Doctor Doolittle. Come on! <laughs> and you know how much that cost Drew to find out that Cyborg lost? That cost Drew three thousand dollars. What I'm trying to say is, now that I got what essentially is the biggest tax refund of my life by canceling my subscription to Flow Grappling. By the way, guys, if this is insulting, I'm totally just kidding. I've never subscribed to Flow Grappling because I'm not a fucking <laughs> idiot. Um, if this, oh my god, I, I have used all of that extra money to support. SuperRareShop.com. Now, nice. listen, uh, Super Rare, by the way, uh, not aware that I'm making fun of, of Flow Grappling. I don't know <laughs> their relationship. doesn't matter. I would like to cut now a very serious uh, interview, which is Super Rare. Uh, they have two shops, and those shops are closed in yeah. New York and Los Angeles because they did the right thing. And, you know, Los Angeles is, like, literally on lockdown. So I am making a very personal plea to everybody right now um if you can if you can afford a fucking t-shirt they legitimately have the just go fucking look like if you space out during i mean everyone says they don't space out during our ads i know on other podcasts you space out during ads but like go right now 
superairshop.com. It is the slickest gear. It's pretty much all I wear besides like my friend's shirts that I've gotten. Um, I've, before they were sponsors, I went there on Melrose. I used to buy gear. I'd bring my fucking rock star friends. They would buy gear. Um, incredibly cool boxing gloves, whatever. These are the kind of places that need to stay in business. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, thankfully they have, people. thankfully they have like a digital presence. They have a kick-ass website. And this is something that all the businesses nowadays that are suffering are starting to see like they wish they had was yeah. a good digital option while their brick and mortar stores shut down. Like, you know, I was talking to uh, Sile, who is the moderator for Rubber Guard Assassins the other day. And he's big and- so fucking cool. We got him he, on the phone. He's so time. smart too. Like really he, smart. he follows businesses really closely and business in general. And he told me yeah. that since the lockdown, the American lockdown, uh, you know, nationwide uh, since the coronavirus, that on Amazon- it. Yeah. Amazon has made, I think, $4 billion. Oh, yeah. I mean, my, I just ordered a bunch of shit on Amazon, and it's not coming till May. <laughs> and you know... It, like, no, it's, it's seriously not coming till May. Oh, it, it doesn't surprise me. Everybody's buying shit online right now. and Everybody's going digital for everything. So, I mean, you might be the first time listener to this podcast because you, you're bored out of your fucking mind, and you found some free content to check out. I know, like, other ones like Tinder and uh, Grinder for Jamie. Yeah, um, thank you so that, much that are uh, experiencing boosts right now. I'm just saying there's a lot more users on there than usual. And to stand out, you're probably going to want some kick-ass gear. And this shit has been proven a pussy magnet. Can I just stick up for myself with the grinder thing really quick? <laughs> Which no. Is, guys are just far more open to compliment you and make you mm-hmm. feel good about uh, yourself. So do I go on there for compliments? Yes. Um, do I engage in... Uh, Gay activity. I mean, also, yes, but it's the point is supershop.com. Uh, you'll also get 15% off, but like, I want to make sure I want us, our people, our fucking tribe, whatever the fuck we're called. <laughs> we're gonna find a name one of these days. <laughs> one day it's just like someone's gonna say something, and we're yeah. gonna be like, yes, we oh, are the Smurfs. You're right. How, how about from the Craig Jones interview? We can be the cunts. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. Good the, cunts. Some of us will na- be the ugly cunts. <laughs> the rear naked radio c- ugly cunts. Um, the <laughs> I want us, like I don't want their fucking. I'm sure they're doing fine, but I don't want any. I don't want to risk anything happening to their shops because their shops. Mm-hmm. It's just like. Just like I don't want bookstores to go under. Like you walk yeah. into a bookstore or when I've walked into Super Rare, it's just special. You know the people behind the counter are fucking fighters. You know they're your fucking tribe and they're your people. And you instantly have this fucking connection with them. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the reason that I even kind of know these guys is because the manager – of the LA shop, like recognize my voice either from like Rogan or like, I think maybe we trained together at Marcelo's. Like there was some weird connection and then he used to play in punk band. So he talked to my friend, Andy Leo from Count the Empire about that. Like it was just (laughs) family right away. And so like, I want to make sure that we get so much shit from them that they can stay in business. And if you have, if you enjoy our show, you guys, Go to superairshop.com, use promo code Rear Naked. You'll get 15% off so you can order a bunch of shit. Tell them we sent you. Um, because we also like, I don't fucking know. I, I don't know how hard this is going to hit them. Like, we need yeah. them as a fucking sponsor. Like, we don't want to lose them or else we're fucked too. So that is what you can do if you're like, you guys do so much for us. This is your chance. Uh, hit up Origin, hit up Super Air. Yeah, look, you're going to buy a $20 shirt. It doesn't hurt your bottom line. It helps everybody involved, especially with all the thousands of people that are watching, sorry, listening, listening and watching that are yeah. going to be doing the same thing. It, it turns into a big thing. Plus, we all look fucking cool at the end. So what's there to lose? Exactly. Amazon don't need your fucking business. Flow Grappling don't need your fucking business. Oh. Go, go to uh, support, support the people who actually support fighters. Mm-hmm. How about that? How about there that? How about, uh, how about the- Jeff the, Bezos. <laughs> Jeff Bezos. How about the <laughs> fact that if we- did commentary on flow we probably would have had to pay to see the fucking event um so support good people like super rare and origin speaking of good people i just want to shout out i want to do some free advertising hey cool for some of our friends um not even just advertisement but just telling people who's cool out there because there's so many personalities that you're going to run into online and they all seem like they think they're the coolest people but there's very few that are the coolest people and we know yeah. them. So the first one I want to say is this guy, Eli Knight. Mm-hmm. Um, Eli Knight, 
Um, his Instagram is great, but his Instagram is not nearly as big as his YouTube. I would YouTube recommend following enormous. him both places. Um, he's a really good teacher. Um, I think it's just called Night Jiu Jitsu. Mm -hmm. And he, again, you know, is someone that like made a lot of money uh, teaching. Um, he is one of those people that is such a good dude that he would be, he, he'll be like, I feel bad, like asking people for help. And then he's the first one anytime someone needs help to like put himself out there. Yep. Uh, the shirt I'm wearing, fighty stuff, this yeah, like man. these kind of like arcade font, uh, that's his. Uh, so he sells dope merch. Um, but he's legitimately just one of like the best humans on the planet. Yeah, he's a gem and we look very much alike. I'm going to actually be on his uh, YouTube live tomorrow and I'm, I'm going to play that line a lot. How oh, uh, Interesting. You know, he didn't ask me to be on YouTube Live, so I'm gonna <laughs> rescind. No, I told I him. I told him we're doing it, and so we're doing it. Oh, okay, fine, fine, fine. <laughs> Um, so he's great. So follow him if you're in the Kentucky area. Um, train with. Uh, he's. I. I if you're I'm in the internet area, he's all over the internet. Yeah, and I mean, I think he's gonna be. I hope I'm trying to convince him to do like more like virtual training stuff, mm -hmm. um, which I think could be really cool. Dude, um, he's got a gigantic course right now. Did you know about that? It's called Deep and it's got like 175 videos jesus christ <laughs> yeah so there's something you can do to support him um two gyms that took a chance on me when uh before i'd given any seminars before and when i went there just had the dopest fucking vibe uh our friend nate harris who uh teaches at dark haven mm -hmm. in albuquerque and i know a lot of their students listen please if you can keep supporting the school don't cancel your memberships carlos condit has started fucking teaching striking there um i've talked about it on this show before um but also 10th planet new york city is run by this fucking badass like couple and like there's pictures of them like posed in front of like the spray paint graffiti 10th planet and like everyone there was so nice and cool and it's a bunch of just like gems of human beings who even though they're just white belts and blue belts are so excited to learn and they actually don't have any of the shitty stereotype kind of white belt blue belts and i think it's because of the examples that these guys send but this is like yeah. a kind of gym i would train at if i lived in new york but also uh it is I'm not, it, it's helping me stay single because I'm like, I'm not settling until I have a fucking ride or die like that. Like, right. like just following them on Instagram is so fucking cool. Where I told both of them this week, I'm like, I want to, I want a relationship like your guys. So uh, those are the three ones that I could think of. Yeah, guys, go support those guys. Uh, all the stuff that they do, make sure to follow them, uh, give them a like. And, you know, like from a coach coming from myself, we're all feeling this thing right now, you know? Uh, us a little more monetarily than other people but other people are losing their jobs too other people can't train too we're kind of all in this same boat so feel feel more than free to reach out to me to jamie on instagram on yeah. youtube um because look like our community is a one-on-one -on -one, you know intimate you're grabbing onto and strangling each other community it's a very close-knit community that is very uh it's awkward and it's strange to not have that that personal social interaction so we need to step up for each other and we need to support each other and we're here to do that yeah and i'm gonna just off of that i'm gonna say something that sounds like i'm complimenting myself but i'm not i'm actually giving you guys something you can do um besides of course uh cancel your subscription to flow grappling and use that money you're saving to uh support, support your, our sponsors <laughs> your local gym and our sponsors and our friends and good people in jujitsu instead of people that uh have essentially a uh, corporate monopoly and overcharge because that's the only place you can watch these events <laughs> um and so that's one thing you could do another thing you could do is <laughs> Remember how I'm always just like, you know, what's great about our show is we support the community and we're like, there's a virus. Cancel your fucking subscriptions to flow. Fuck those motherfuckers. <laughs> I'm just saying there are good people out there that need your uh, support more. Um, but the, you know, I've been doing these dumb comedy sketches that I love. And They're awesome. Yeah, you've been posting them, which I appreciate so fucking much. And... um and it, the, the reason I bring this up is because I made them for me. Uh, mm. I was like, this is something I've always wanted to do. I've been kind of like nervous to do it because I'm not an actor. I don't know how to edit. 
but I'm quarantined. So I was like, <laughs> I'm going to fucking figure out how to do it. And, and it took one day. <laughs> took one day. Well, I get a little obsessive with things. Uh, I've, I've literally done like 20 sketches in like two weeks and gotten like 2,000 new Instagram followers. <laughs> I, go, I, go a little, I go a little to the extreme. Um, this is why I can't drink, by the way. And so, so, I, so I'm doing it for me. And I, cannot, I probably get at least 20 messages a day from people that are like, this is bringing me life. And the same with our podcast during yeah. this hard time. The reason I say that isn't to be like, oh, Jamie, oh, slow clap, slow clap. The reason I say that is because it's a dumb comedy video that I did to make me laugh, which means if you are listening, you have a friend right now that feels really alone and that feels really nervous or whatever that could use a check-in or could use a yes. friend to make them laugh or could use some dumbass internet content like I'm doing. Yeah, and that's so, a really good point, man. A lot of people use jujitsu as like their sanctuary, their mental getaway. Yes. So they they need that. Yes. And so like I wasn't, I, I, I promise, like, look, I whore out my shit all the time. That was not to whore out the videos. That was to say like, here's something that I did, not selfishly, but I did for me that I didn't even think how that would help people. And seeing how it does, it's kind of like, it just made me realize like, oh, we all have that power within us where like all it takes is just checking in on somebody yeah. and yeah. you possibly saved that person, definitely made their day. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't take a lot of effort. I mean, I've been leaving voice memos to complete fucking strangers every day on Instagram just because like this terrible shit should bring us together. Like that's what we can get out of this. It, yeah. One of the few things we can get out of this, you know, is like more compassion, more empathy, more sort of like seeing us as like one and not um, like separate entities or people mm -hmm. to fear or whatever. Yeah. That could be one of the best things to come out of this once it's all over and we're all back training is we're going to really have a new appreciate appreciation for community in general. Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, unless that community is run by uh the Flow Corporation, in which case <laughs> cancel cancel, you'll save so much money. Okay. Um here we'll here. If if you miss Flow, you can listen to our show and uh I'm at eight and the match is over. Head over to Matt Matt Five <laughs> and it's over. Buffering, buffering. Okay. Hey, you think we could get Flow as a sponsor? Uh you know I maybe we could get on their network. You know, let's give it a try. Let's give pump it a try. us up. <laughs> Hey, can we come on your network and have less people see us and make no money? <laughs> also, just don't listen to our episodes because you, you probably won't like them. You're not going to like them. I'm not going to like them. Um, yeah, I think there's going to be – you know what else? I think there's going to be a pushback against bullshit mm -hmm. because all I want to do is see good people succeed. And I mean, like, look, all the people I listed, Eli, Nate, um, Ray Ray, they're very talented jujitsu players, but they're also like, they're good people. Mm -hmm. And I the think that like, oftentimes mutually exclusive. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of good people who are trash and they don't, or uh, sorry, a lot of good jujitsu players who are trash and maybe they don't give a shit about their students. You know, the places mm -hmm. I listed very specifically uh, care about their students, which is why, and, and they do things for other people. I want to help people who want to help people. I want to terrorize um, the people who will take a beautiful sport like jiu-jitsu, like the IBJJF, and fucking monopolize it and try to rob blind the people that made them, the athletes that put their body on the line uh, in the first place. So I feel like in, a, in one way, the, uh, this quarantine is making me far more compassionate and wanting to reach out and help people. <laughs> but, but the in other way, much more fun way. <laughs> just to punish my enemies and just like make a fucking shit list and like, eh, I'm gonna have some enemies and I'm okay with that because it's like, jujitsu is too beautiful, man. It, it, it can be such a beautiful thing that brings people together and to see to see some take advantage of that, I'm just like, I'm removed enough from it that I'm like, I can, I can fucking throw some heat. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, man. So yeah, that's what I got. 
that was great. That was a great episode, guys. Uh, make sure you check out all our other episodes. We got 16 other ones. If you're new to the podcast, we're uh, putting them out every week, every Monday. Uh, yep. Check out Jamie at the Jamie Kilstein on Instagram. Uh, I run because Jitsu, because underscore Jitsu on Instagram. Check out you, me for some comedy. You can also get Drew's. Uh, uh, that fucking meme you posted the other day of the uh, <laughs> of the the crying, but then the crying and smiling when the guy who oh, yeah. you wants so good. Um, yeah, Drew's hilarious, obviously, but also. So uh, you can get his reverse Kimura series mm -hmm. uh, as well, which is really, really fucking good. And uh, you can get that online. Uh, and that'll help as well. That's all right. Sweet. We'll see you next Monday, guys. Bye, guys.